we're back. So today um, I want to talk about high elevation and travel. And so uh, we're going to be joined by one of our favorite guests, Dr. McQueen Yvette. Uh, we had some live streams in the past where she came in and shared her knowledge about traveling, health and travel to be specific. And so um, if you give me one second, I'm gonna bring her in and we'll get started. Got a little clickety clack down on the ground here. Oh, are you okay? Hi, Dr. Eva. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Perfectly. Okay, great. Huh? Hi. Awesome. How are you? I'm great. <laughs> How was all your traveling around Europe? Oh, it was. It was fun. Europe, but you know, Europe is so busy during the summer, so. I prefer to do it in the fall, but I still had a great time. Okay, awesome. All right, well, welcome uh, um, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, so we'll start with the quick introduction. If you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and talk about what you do, and then we'll take it from there. Okay, hi, everybody. Thank you for uh, letting me be on your site. I appreciate it. So I am Yvette McQueen, MD. I'm an emergency physician and travel doctor. Uh, a global physician on a mission to educate about health, travel wellness, and disease prevention. I'm going to uh, go ahead and apologize about the lighting because I am sitting from a hotel and I'm trying to get the window lighting. Um, there's a light in front of me, but it doesn't want to move. <laughs> uh, so I um, actually assist travelers like yourselves to stay healthy and safe while they're traveling with my travel medicine advice, uh, my books, I have a book, Travel 911, tips, and, um, you know, follow me and you can stay safe while you're traveling. Awesome. Uh, we, I like uh, the book, Travel 911. I was going to grab a copy, but I forgot, but I have a copy of it, but it's really nice. I highly suggest it to anyone who's watching uh, to really get some general um, tips about traveling in general, whether you're just a new traveler or you've been traveling for a while. Super helpful. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Yvette, for joining us today. I'm really excited. So uh, we wanted to do this live stream in preparation for the group trip that we are uh, doing to Peru. And it's going to be mostly about hiking the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu. And just to give some um, background to everyone who's watching today um, the city of Cusco where this adventure is traveling is located at about 11,000 feet so one of the big challenges for traveling to Cusco and doing the Inca Trail is high elevation and so that's why we wanted to get some advice from um, Dr. Yvette to share with us things that we should know about high elevation things that we should do and things to avoid so um, maybe we'll get started and if you want to help us understand first of all what it's like to be at elevation and then from a medical standpoint how does the body react why is it hard to be at elevation so yes thank you so uh like she said uh high altitude in, in your peru wonderful place to go um travel but you can also experience it even if you're um hiking in any of the mountains even here in the united states so high altitude uh, your body responds if there's a change was we say 5,000 feet. Yeah, I can't, I forgot how to translate that in, um, <laughs> someone can translate that in meters for me. <laughs> um, so if like, if you go any change of 5,000 feet, your body's gonna respond to the elevation. And it's basically your lungs and your heart uh, are affected. So your lungs are used to whatever mm -hmm. altitude that you live at. So if you live at sea level, so even, even if you're in Lima, okay, uh, Lima, Peru, you're at sea level, the beach is right there. And then you're going up to, um, Cusco is actually higher than uh, Machu Picchu because you go up to Cusco and come back down a little bit. But um, it's, the air is thinner. So the cells in your body, I'm trying, I won't be too scientific, the cells in your body <laughs> actually uh, will receive the oxygen a little bit less. So that's why one of the best things they tell you is to acclimate. So one of the good things, if you're hiking, um, you're only taking so many feet per day. Is that what you're going to hike or are you just going straight to Cusco? 
So uh, the adventure starts from Cusco, which is 11,000 feet. And then the trek itself starts at um, around 8,000 feet. Mm -hmm. And then we climb all the way up to 13,000 feet. I believe that's what it was. Yeah, okay. the famous okay. pass there is called, well, it's called Dead Woman's Pass um, for reasons that they will teach you about on the trail. But about a 5,000 foot elevation gain over the course of the hike. How many days is the hike? Four days. Oh. See, that's a wonderful pace. You don't try to do it in the same day. So that's the one thing. So when you go from like, from zero to 11,000 feet, you need some times or hours to acclimate it. So that first day when it starts in Cusco, um, you're gonna just rest. And that's what they tell other people. One of the things is to acclimate when you have that change of pace. First of all, you rest. You don't try to do any strenuous the first day and let your body kind of adjust and say, hey, I'm here, new altitude, new air. Uh, <laughs> give me a few hours to adjust. And then as you hike, and if you go over four days, you're doing a nice slow pace. Um, you're not rushing and your body can adjust to that. Okay, awesome. Um, I know one of the things that I noticed when we got there was that the Airbnbs or guest houses, they would offer us uh, coca tea and they say that it helps with the, with the high altitude sickness. Um, I'm wondering what are some other things that we can do to at least alleviate some of that pain that we get from being at altitude? Okay, so the first thing I tell people is stay hydrated. <laughs> That's my number one uh, tip to any traveling whatsoever, but definitely for adjusting is to stay hydrated. Um, that keeps your blood moving, uh, pumping, um, you won't get any like with sluggish feeling uh, to stay hydrated. Yes, yeah, some of the uh, Airbnbs and hotels, they actually have oxygen tanks, uh, I've heard, in some rooms where they give you some oxygen. So if you feel yourself uh, winded, the first thing is to stop and rest, stop and rest. Uh, if you need a little bit more assistance, they will give you oxygen. Cocoa, cocoa leaves or cocoa tea we don't know the mechanism i'm going to be honest we don't know the science behind it that helps you do it uh, it's just one of those things that the um, local people the native people of peru knows that works so if they know it works do it uh, if you want to prepare ahead of time talk to your physician before you leave for a hike like that you need to talk to your physician and say hey i'm going to go into high altitude um, can my body take it and certain People with certain disorders, particularly if they have lung disorders, people with asthma, uh, COPD, which is like chronic pulmonary disease. Uh, people that, uh, if you have any blood disorder, like sickle cell, because your blood, red blood cells carries oxygen. So if you, you're having trouble already with your red blood cells, because I know, I know a football player that can't play in Denver because of his mm. sickle cell. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> so he always has to sit that game out. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so talk to your doctor ahead of time. They may give you some medicine. There's different types of medicine they can give you just in case you experience um, any high altitude sickness. And I'll, uh, I'll go over those symptoms if you want me to. Yeah, I think that would be helpful to, to know what the symptoms are. Okay. Yes. So um, there's, there's different ones, and I'm read this, like she said, my book. Here you go. 9 travel 911 and actually I'm gonna read it straight from here so the least severe one we call is acute mountain sickness so you would get a headache a lot of people say you get the headache um it, 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 you just get that pounding headache that won't get away um you can get loss of appetite you can get very nauseous you just feel like oh, oh i feel it's almost I'm not going to say fluish because you don't get achy, but you just um, get that headache, you get that irritability. Some people have trouble sleeping um, and just fatigue and exhaustion. And that's why they tell you to acclimate. If so, just acclimate, hang out. Um, don't go any higher um, because the higher you go, the, the, it'll, it'll just start to kick in more. So that's the first thing. So you use your cocoa teas, your medicine they give you, or um, the oxygen. The next set, if you start to go higher, and we get what we call high altitude pulmonary edema, where your lungs is not being effective, what happens is your lungs start to fill up water. Edema means water. 
till what happens is your your lung you, your heart's not pumping as effectively pushing water back into your lungs that's when you really huffing and puffing i mean if you can if you can't go 50 feet and not to, struggling to breathe and you can't actually make a full sentence while speaking you need to stop and sometimes they tell people to descend or go back to the level where they felt better because your your heart your heart and your lungs will just start to fill out water. So you need to go back, uh, go back and get some oxygen. You might start to feel a little bit better. The most severe one is when it affects your brain. So you first of all, you get your headache, your nausea, your fatigue, and then your lungs start to fill up with water. You need to go back to a level that you felt better. The most severe one, that edema, it starts to accumulate on the brain and that one you don't want so if you're hiking and someone starts to be and i don't use this word lethargic very lightly lethargic is basically you're out of it if i poked you right now you would not respond you just like uh, or you're not making sense you're mumbling um you just incoherent and some people actually go in a coma that's a true actual emergency they need to take you down immediately um, um, and see a doctor immediately for that one. Now, I know when I've had different medicines in the past, I think the first time Habib when I went to get a physician to prescribe us something, um, some of the side effects included sun sensitivity. And I think one of the primary differences between the, the drug Habiba was given and the one I was given initially was that sun sensitivity. Um, are there any other side effects of note or any reason to prefer one particular medication over another for length of time you're above altitude or how high it is or how confident you are that you might be able to deal with the altitude or are they all same same same, uh, same drug at the end of the day just for different people is that this is when you did the mount kilimanjaro yeah. right yeah <laughs> i remember you saying that yeah it's oh, I'm repeating so, myself. <laughs> that, that's okay <laughs> So make sure you, um, when you talk to your doctor, first of all, I'm be honest with you, all doctors don't understand high altitude sickness, okay? So you might actually need to go to um, a travel clinic or a doctor that's used to that. Um, also, one of the um, medications, if you're allergic to sulfur drugs, you can't take. Uh, acetosolamide, A-Z-E-T-O, something, 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 acetosolamide. If you are allergic to sulfur drugs, and that's the one of the ones we give to people, you can't take that. So um, that may be a situation that happened. Um, yes, there can be light sensitive, which the same thing when we do with one of the drugs for malaria is light sensitive. Well, you got to be somewhere that's light. You're going to be in the mountains. It's got to be sunlight, you know, <laughs> even though it may be cloudy, that, that UVA, UV, U, UVB is still coming through, though. So it's light sensitive. So it's just how your bodies react to it. So uh, one of, um, let's see, what did I say here? So you plan it, um, you stay hydrated, avoid intense exercise immediately, particularly if you get short of breath and fatigue. Um, they say eat a high carb rate carbohydrate diet so all of those that of us that avoid carbs this is the time to eat it because <laughs> you want that energy uh 70 70 percent of the meal should be carbohydrates yeah uh, once at least once two days prior to um you making that hike or sin um i think we lost your audio there for a moment i think we, we just lost you uh, dr Ibeck. Acetosolamide, uh, nafetapine is nafetapine is a what we call a calcium channel blocker. Uh, we give it for um, hypertension. You may see that medicine. Um, so that's um, and um, the other one they may give you is a steroid, uh, dexamethasone or decadron. It's a plus or minus whether the steroids help or not. It definitely helps with the edema. Um, but then if you already have edema, it's too late. So sometimes they put you on ahead of time. If you're a diabetic, be careful with taking the steroids because it's only increasing your blood sugar. And that's another thing, other conditions. 
Like if you're a diabetic, you may need to adjust your, your medication, uh, what you eat or your insulin because you're using extra energy and your sugar may drop a little bit. Uh, if you are um, have any heart disease at all, definitely see your doctor before making this hike and they will let you know whether it's appropriate or not. So oh, in Peru, the cocoa leaves, they either chew it or make a tea. Um, it sometimes will actually be um, what they call, go away. They actually will say it's a um, appetite suppressant too. So if you're drinking the cocoa leaves or chewing the cocoa leaves, you may not feel like you want to eat as much, but continue to eat. Um, and then your cheeks will become numb because sometimes they have a little numbing effect, but it's not addictive. It is not cocaine. So a lot of people will say, oh, I got to go back and do a testing for work. Don't worry about it. it it's not going to show up. <laughs> Can I ask you a question then? Uh, we've talked a lot about what's going to end up happening if I have uh, one of the high altitude illnesses or ailments that might come. But what are the sort of things that I could do if I wanted to send my red blood cells to the gym and prepare them for this particular trip up? Are there like acclimatization hikes I can do well in advance as part of my training that will get my body prepared for that? Or is the discipline strictly showing up early and just giving yourself time once you're on the site? A lot of that, well, showing up early and giving your time to sight. But second of all, you have to also let your your blood know that you're going to be doing exercise. So um, if you're a couch potato and you go say, hey, I'm going to do Peru, and you haven't been in the gym in forever, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would have advised to do some training ahead of time, at least six months ahead of time. And that's why um, that hike um, particularly the way you're doing it is not for the lighthearted because I know a lot of people just say oh I'm gonna go to Peru and they get on the plane and they go up there but then they're taking the train or going up to the Inca or even the, the Rainbow Mountain is even uh, was it Rainbow Mountain it's like, I think 14,000 feet yeah. if I remember correctly uh, like 16. I think it's way up there yeah it's even higher yeah, yeah. so uh, yeah that's uh, for that for the faint of heart and some people I know um, I know someone that did it. She's like, I took the donkey. I did not try to walk <laughs> it up there. <laughs> it's all plenty of people on donkeys on their trails. So. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but I would say train for it. And um, I know that I I have a group that's going in December. Ah. And I and I'm not a I'm I'm not a gym person, but I <laughs> <laughs> but I have started going to the gym and going to start ramping it up at least um, doing the walking, walking and doing the incline. Um, or taking myself, um, I've considered, um, sorry, taking myself to go, I live at sea level uh, in Georgia, Florida, and I plan to make a few trips to uh, New Mexico and Colorado uh, within the next six months so that my body starts to get used to some of that. Because I did used to work in New Mexico, and as soon as I got up there, I knew I would start huffing and puffing. So... <laughs> Um, just to acclimate my body that, you know, hey, you know there's going to be a change um, at least once a month. So exercise, um, get your body in tune to um, stimulating breathing more or, or actually your lungs breathing more, having that blood flow breathing more. But just um, do some vigorous walks. Yeah, I think uh, even when I talk about the group trip, that's what I try to tell people. I mean, it's not impossible. But if you are committed, then you have enough time. Like with our group trip right now, we have five months until the group trip. And if you really go out there and train and prepare for it, and then even understand, because I feel like a lot of people don't understand even what, uh, you know, the symptoms of high altitude sickness. And that's why we're trying to explain that through, through the live stream. But if someone, you don't have to be an experienced hiker in order to do this. You just have to be knowledgeable about what's going on and then prepare and train properly exactly 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 and i've heard as well that there are people that'll run long distance marathons other things like that that'll go up to altitude and will just struggle and there's no way really around that there'll be some people who are otherwise not entirely active and they just handle altitude better and it's on a per person per person basis um is it that, is that a true statement i just want to make sure that i understand that correctly right it's all about your own physiology how your own blood works um so um, we all we all have different um, 
what so your blood is made of the two different cells white cells and, and red cells and it's the red cells that carries the oxygen so that's why i mentioned like certain uh if you have blood disorder sickle cell disease thalassemia um some people um with uh lupus sometimes have a problem that your blood is a little bit thicker and I, that it you don't make you think it's like i don't want to say it's the difference in water or syrup but your blood's a little bit thicker which means it moves a little bit slower mm. or um then it won't carry the oxygen as well and it's all how everyone's made up okay um i think uh, i'm reading a question here how many days should you acclimate in cusco before you start the hike uh, they say anywhere between most people acclimate six to twelve hours and be honest with you six to twelve hours um you go up there and you rest you rest you start breathing the air you could you could take a walk around the little town a little square so you know but don't don't go say oh i'm going running as soon as i get up there, <laughs> i'm gonna take my morning jog um you may not be able to do that um so six to twelve hours but if you start to hike once again the first thing you start to feel is that headache that fatigue uh that sluggishness um and make sure you try to sleep even if you are do have the insomnia so some people are prescribed some sleeping pills um that's up to you there's different things you can take for sleep um like the melatonin uh, some people take benadryl uh, or they can take um, a prescribed one by your doctor i remember when we arrived to cusco because we were very excited first time in peru and we just was like, oh my gosh we're gonna get there when we're gonna go out and see the city and go around the uh, plaza de armas and explore but we were so beat up with the headaches even taking the stairs to get to the second floor of our guest house was a pain <laughs> right and, and near the historic district which is where we've learned a lot of people go is very hilly so if you are walking downtown to some of those squares and plazas and such you will be you'll be working also mm -hmm. um, so yeah and um, this is why for for the group trip that we're leading in uh, november i tried to plan it in a way that Okay, we're gonna arrive to Cusco and the first night we're just gonna have our group dinner and then the second day is gonna be walking around the city, not doing too much. And then the third day is an acclimatization hike. And then by, by that time, we will be ready to start the Inca Trail. So hopefully we, the, the body would have adjusted mm -hmm. to it. And I think that's a wonderful schedule. That's a wonderful schedule. Can I ask a little bit of an outside question then for a moment? Uh, I know some people that I've seen on the mountains training use some of the oxygen deprivation masks. And I've always seen them and I've been very curious as to what it would be like to have one or what they would even feel like doing. Are they a reasonable way to try to train your body for being at altitude as well if you can't get away from your natural altitude? Or um, are they more commercial show? <laughs> oh, that's uh, interesting. I I'm be honest with you. I've never any, had known anyone that does it, but I guess it's trying to train your body to say you don't have enough oxygen. How are you going to react? Sure. But I would say definitely be having a control situation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I don't know anyone that's used it, so I wish okay. I could answer that question. For you. They remind me of the, the mask that you would see Bane wearing in the Batman movies and such. There was a notorious man in Arizona that we would see going up and down the. Um, What's the one Camelback, Camelback Mountain, Mountain right in the middle of Arizona? And, and he oh, would use the mask okay. all the time. And we became very, he, he was very recognizable. Yeah. Okay. Camelback is, a, Camelback is only what, about 4,500? Is that, that's not it's, that high though, right? It's not, no. it's, it's not that high, but uh, it's a popular hike to just train in general. And so some people would wear masks to reduce the level of yeah. oxygen. Yeah, oxygen, oxygen going in there. Yeah, but it was just pretty interesting because even if it's not high, it was a difficult hike, but people would do that as a way of training. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because someone said try short hikes at first before going to the high altitude. Right. So try those short hikes. And that's why I say I do like either go to New Mexico or Denver because, you know, that's like me changing. As like I said, if there's any change of 5,000 feet, uh, if anyone wants calculate that in meters <laughs> you can't but if there's any change of 5,000 feet your body notice the difference okay. um, so I have a, a specific question about the trail so uh, we do everything that we can when it comes to training and preparing and we are hydrating following all the rules 
And now for a person who's already hiking on the Inca Trail, that we will have guides and usually they, they know how to assess the situation if somebody is not feeling well. Um, but I want to I wanna understand, like, at one point, do you, do you distinguish between, okay, this is me pushing myself harder than I'm used to, and this is the point where I should know that my body is not handling this, I should go back. Like, what type of symptoms or indications can help us make that decision? Okay. Yeah, so someone said um, water, water is necessary, so hydration. So um, the difference is your body, um, you're struggling. The difference is like if I'm, I'm uh, walking, say if I'm walking, as I'm walking, I'm starting to breathe different and I'm, my, sh my steps are getting shorter and I really can't breathe. I mean, you, the difference is, oh, I'll be walking up the hill, oh, okay. Walking up the hill versus, <laughs> And you really, I mean, you really taking those deep breaths. You really can't, you can't go 10 feet without actually stopping. Um, your, your head starts, you just start to swim. You start to feel like you can't think or actually function. You just need, immediately stop. Your body lets you know when you can't go on. And you really do need to listen to your body. And it's not just, um, I haven't, I haven't walked, you know, a mile in a, in a day. And there's a little exhaustion and I'm just exerting myself. This is actually where you actually struggling. You're struggling to breathe and you know, and it's almost like a suffocation because that's what happens when, when uh, water gets in your lungs, you actually start to feel suffocating. Did that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's just sometimes uh, because I, I know for when I started hiking and especially hikes like this that I wasn't used to, at first I always question, oh my gosh, like is this just me trying to persevere and be strong or is it the point where I should just turn back? So sometimes it's not clear to just, you know, listen to your body and make the right decision. Um, so Alan just mentioned uh, about... Uh, Minimizing backpack weight without risk and that 30 pounds at altitude can feel like 50, 60 pounds and that's totally true. Okay. okay, yeah. So I don't know how you're doing with people going to take the backpack. I know sometimes you guys um, hike with the water backpack. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah so... <laughs> 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 so um, for the Inca Trail, for this particular hike, uh, the way it goes, all you really have to carry with you is your day pack, which is 30, 35 liters usually. And you just throw in uh, water, snacks, poncho, rain jacket, some layers, and, you know, just the essentials for day hikes. And then you have the option to hire forcers, which, thank God, they are there because they do help any excess gear that you don't need for the day hike. And uh, when we did the trek, we made the mistake of packing everything on our own which was not a good idea because like Alan said, just 30 pounds can feel like the double when you are going uphill. And two, you're trying to prove two, something. It's gonna, yeah, and two, it's gonna, you always gotta remember, if you're coming from, if you're coming from North America, going there, it's, it's the opposite season, right? Yeah. People have to remember it's the opposite. It's, it's, it is, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, opposite. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's uh, you're thinking, oh, I'm going to November and December and it's gonna be winter, it's gonna be cool and I'm gonna be, but yeah, like you say, layered clothing makes a difference um, because if you, it, there'll be a difference between, am I doing this because I'm overheating because I have too many clothes on and I can just like do a little peel off and then add to it or versus if my body's responding. Now, I was going to ask as well then, I know for people that want to go up this high, there is usually a different type of traveler's insurance that might come with that as well. Um, are these things that would fall under the purview of a conversation about medicine like this? Or is that one step too far removed for me to ask questions of? Okay, so um, traveler's insurance, buy it. <laughs> I'm just going to go ahead and buy it. But there are different ones. Uh, particularly like with you guys, you are, are experienced hikers, you hike everywhere, and I don't know what type of travel insurance, but there is different ones for people that do say uh, if they knew they were going to be doing the bungee jumping or whatever, uh, what they call adventurous ones. If this is just an average trip, which, you know, people go to Machu Picchu all the time, you know, it's, it's considered a tourist spot. I, the, the regular uh, travel insurance should cover it. What I will tell you is 
make sure it has a medical component. So it's not like <clears throat> when you get your airline ticket and you just check that extra box. That's going to cover the airline. Sometimes it doesn't cause, cover medical insurance. Make sure you are going to an uh, actual company that does medical, uh, that does travel insurance, and it says the medical on there. Like you have, it'll cover you by 5K. They'll say 5K is covered if you need to be, um, you know, seen by a doctor. Uh, it covers evacuation, at least 25K, because if they need to, if for some reason you get sick enough that they need to put you on a plane and take you back down to Lima. Uh, <laughs> you know, you want that 25K coverage uh, for them to put you on that medical airplane to take you back down, so. So yes to travel insurance. And yes, we always yes. suggest travel insurance because you just never know. By the end of the day, it's a personal choice, but I think it's always a good idea. I know some places require a high altitude insurance as well. I don't think that Peru no. crosses the line though. So I don't think that anybody would need to consider something that high. No, that's like Mount Kilimanjaro. That's you forcefully saying, I'm going to hike Mount Kilimanjaro. I'm going up in the Himalayas um, that where Peru, like I said, that's just a, a normal tourist spot that I don't think you need that specialized one for that. Okay. Um, we have a comment here uh, about yoga and breathing exercises and if they can be helpful in this case. Exercise, once again, don't go, we'll go from being a couch potato to doing this, but um, it's... Um, that's going to help you with yoga. Of course, it's going to help you mentally. Uh, yoga is going to help you with the muscles, the stretch. It's not going to help you with your red blood cells. <laughs> okay. Um, I have the, another question about uh, not related to altitude, but just general travel safety in Peru when it comes to what, avoiding water or, or, or food uh, contamination and things like that. Um, You've been, so you can let me know, but my general thing is if I'm not used to the, to the area and my GI tract is not used to the normal bacteria of the area, I use filtered water or bottled water wherever I go. That's just me in general, unless, you know, in the hotels, they'll tell you we have filtered water. Um, we have, you know, our hotels filtered. And that makes a difference of whether you're brushing your teeth with the faucet water versus your bottled water. If I'm unsure at any point, I'm going to use bottled water um, to even brush my teeth, put on my toothbrush, things like that. That's just general, general water anywhere. Uh, and on the trail, actually, because this question came up the other day, um, because the porters and the guide will be providing the hikers with water every day. So the way it works on the mountain, the chef would boil a large quantity of water to make sure that the water is uh, good to be consumed. They let it sit there for a little bit to cool down, and then they would give it to the travelers. Oh, that's one. For boiled water, uh, yes, boiled water. I mean, like, so if you're going somewhere and like in India, people drink a lot of tea. I'm okay because we know that's steam and hot. <laughs> so boiled water is good. Um, some people also take um, the some tablets. Um, I forgot what they're called, but they have um, uh, acclimation tablets or a purification tablet. Mm -hmm. You could take those and always add to your water if you're unsure. Or they now also make, um, I'm not going to call the company because I'm not endorsed by anybody, but they make bottles um, that where it actually has a filter to it um, that you can actually put it in, your, in the bottle um, and it filters through like carbon filter, whatever, to make it filter water. Awesome. Um, there's another comment about having adequate supply of thermal blankets on hand, like thermal blankets of the emergency blanket. I would assume that that's what a thermal blanket means in this mm -hmm. case, but anything to keep you warm, I'm assuming would help you as you may get colder if you were dehydrated or running thin up top. Am I going too far in what I'm guessing there? No, well, I mean, I'm think they're probably thinking that the mountains getting too cold. That's like hypothermia. Okay. Yeah, because usually I think in the small emergency kits, like every emergency kit would have a thermal blanket. So yeah, it looks like an aluminum sheet. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah. I, I remember one time uh, we were hiking the Grand Canyon, and uh, one of the hikers was just not a hiker at all, never trained, and then just showed up and 
just started shivering so he couldn't keep the temperature of his body inside so they ended up wrapping him in mm -hmm. um, thermal blanket like that okay awesome um do we have anything else here? i don't think i have any any other pertinent questions pertaining to altitude no okay uh this was awesome uh, do you have any other tips traveling to peru that would be helpful to people and um, well, I think we're still getting some questions, but really anything that can help somebody who's hesitant about going to Peru, because I know it's not uh, the easiest destination to travel to, but at the same time, it's not the craziest destination to go to. Yeah, it's not crazy. It's not crazy. Uh, someone asks, would UV light? No, please. Purification or boil it. UV light? No. <laughs> For water. <laughs> and I can say just once again, um, listen to your body once again listen to your body because your body is going to be honest and true to you um about the hike and whether you could complete it and let someone know always i would always have, have of course i'm sure you tell people have a buddy system let somebody know uh, particularly if you're on this hike and you do have a medical problems i know a lot of people like being secretive and no oh, it's my body no one should know um have a buddy system that somebody knows that hey um you know, I do have a little asthma, and if something happens to me, here's my inhaler. <laughs> because if you pass out, someone's gonna be like, "What's wrong with them? Where do I go?" So, um, someone should know in your in your system what to do. Um, good shoes are gonna be very important. I'm sure you go over that about type of hiking shoes because if your if your legs and um, your feet and your legs get fatigued it's gonna actually um, draw more of your hydration. Um, you get what we call lactic acidosis because the, the muscle breaks down, breaks down into this molecule called a lactate and it builds up in your body. It's a big molecule and usually the kidney can filter it, but if you get too much, it's like trying to push a lot of stuff through a filter that won't go and hydration is so key hydration is so key so if you start to feel your muscles are fatigued and sore um drink more water more water more water you get leg cramping drink more water 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 awesome i think uh, it's sometimes when you're hiking it's just like when you're feeling good you keep hiking you forget about the water until <laughs> it's probably too late that's why i like the uh, water bladders that you mm -hmm. can have on your camel back and then you just have the tube close to you this way you can hydrate all the time right. having to stop and take you know a bottle from your bag the point too is to go hydrated already so a lot of us are mm -hmm. normally dehydrated and i say when i see people in the hospital i just assume they're a leader down i do i say everybody needs a leader <laughs> <laughs> so uh if you so just like you're training um for the hike um, train your body to receive the water because if you flood yourself your body with water it's just going to pee out a lot but if you're used to intaking that amount of your normal body water then it's going to like use and stimulate your blood and your cells so the the formula i like to use is uh the normal daily intake of water should be half your body weight in ounces, okay? So you can translate that to liter, ki ki kilograms, but say if you are a 150 pound person, you should be drinking 75 ounces of water per day. You're like, that's a lot of water, <laughs> but that's just the normal. That's just the normal. That's not even adding the extra that you need. So yes, when you start doing that and people are like, well, then I'm gonna have to pee and then I'm gonna have to get off the trail. But if you've done that over the month ahead of time, before you start hiking, your body uh, knows how to handle that and you're not gonna be running to the bathroom all the time. I was afraid you were gonna say 75 pounds of water. And I was gonna say, <laughs> I should lose some more weight. <laughs> <laughs> Ounces, so it's pounds to ounces. Yeah, sure, half, sure. half of your body weight in ounces. Oh, one more thing about uh, so dehydrate uh, hydration. We talked about what about nutrition on the trail while we're hiking? I, I know you mentioned that we need to load up on carbs maybe the days before, and they do a great job of feeding us all great food on the trail. But then just uh, in between, let's say we start, we have breakfast, and then we hike for five hours until um, it's time for lunch. Yes, we still need to make sure that we are um, having some snacks or eating food on the trail. Yeah, you make sure because once again, I say high altitude would make you feel like you don't want to eat or suppress the altitude, uh, suppress your appetite. 
Um, I know a lot of people are like, oh, I'm going to do a protein bar. Uh, I think your snacks should be um, high energy one. You can do like nuts and things like that, but high energy ones um, because the protein um, is once again, it's a big molecule. Yes, the protein helps with the muscles, but it's going to be a, a big molecule trying to be filtered through your kidney and it's going to be competing with everything else. So that's why they say stay, stick with, uh, but snacks are good. What about things like the high density, nutrient dense sort of uh, goos that you would see other on the go athletes? I know they're already they're very easy to digest in the terms that they're not food that you have to chew up and then it, are they worth it or are they not helpful in this situation? You mean, you mean the commercial ones? I think I like, like uh, Gatorade goo or um, other ones like that. I don't know what else I would call them, but goos. I don't know. You know, yeah, just eat regular food. <laughs> Um, that I will say one of the, uh, to stick, keep up with your electrolytes, I have found one of the good things is, um, who do I have in here? It's called the high, I, IV hydration packages. Yes. Liquid um, IV. Liquid IV. Liquid IV. That's it. Liquid <laughs> IV. So yes. I, so you put it in there, it keeps up your electrolytes and it's not as high as in sugar as some of the other ones. And I did see recently, they now make it sugar free. Mm. Oh, that's that's perfect. I I was actually just the other day talking to a friend because the liquid IVs are great. Uh, you just throw them there for electrolytes, but I don't like the high sugar in there. It's just mm. it's it's nice to hear that they are coming up with the sugar free mm -hmm. ones. Mm -hmm. They are, yeah. Awesome. I think that's it for us, really. Yeah. If you want, we can give you the floor for a moment. You can just tell us what you have going on or anything <laughs> yeah. you want to you want to say about your adventure, your story here. Sure. Yeah. So. Uh, once again, um, you know, like I said, I'm a travel medicine doctor. Um, I do travel the world, but I also recently, I don't know if you know that I'm actually have become a travel advisor. So I'm a certified oh. travel advisor. I know another thing in my pocket. <laughs> so I do plan group trips myself um, with um, my professionals and I cater to uh, physicians, uh, mostly to physicians groups that want to travel because I give them continued medical education. Okay. Um, where they can actually get lectures and um, use their education money to take these trips. Then they're culturally immersion or um, basically some of them are pampering. <laughs> oh. So uh, my site, if you want to check me out, is MedQueen, that's M-E-D, Queen Tours, T-O-U-R-S dot com. You can go to that site. Uh, I talked about my book, Travel 911. It's good for everybody. It's written for um, the non-medical person. And, you know, we talked about high altitude sickness, but it also talks about jet lag, blood clot, traveler's diarrhea, give a little first aid kit. So if you're hiking and you need to make a makeshift splint for your ankle or your arm, it's in here, okay? Um, and you can uh, get this on Amazon if you want it electronically, Books of Novo, or you can go to Travel 911 Book, I keep things simple, travel911book.com, and I will send you a copy. Awesome. And uh, by the way, about the book, I do have an extra copy. So if anyone watching us right now is interested in grabbing the copy, just send me a direct message, and I will be happy to send you one. So first message I receive, I will send a copy of the Travel 911. And it's a really, really nice, easy read. I remember first time, uh, first time I had it, we just read it on the way to Kilimanjaro. <laughs> when we were going to uh, Tanzania. Very easy read. Great. Thank awesome. you for the endorsement. Yeah. Awesome. And, and uh, for about the, the group trip, uh, this, is, uh, this is happening from November 6th to November 16th. This is a, group, a hiking group trip. So we will be hiking the Inca Trail alongside with other trails in, uh, in Peru, like Rainbow Mountain, Lake Humatai. So if you guys need any questions about the detailed day-by-day -day itinerary, just send me a message and I will be happy to, to share that with you. Um, I think uh, we can probably wrap up. Thank you so much, Dr. Yvette McQueen. I just love that you give us of your time all the time whenever it comes to learning about healthy things to do while traveling. So we really appreciate your time. Well, I hope you have a great trip. And you know if you, you're, you're hiking there and you got Wi-Fi and you want to text me, you know you can. Awesome, <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Yvette. Ciao. All right. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.